I'm here with Ella Duan, and today we are interviewing Alexander McCall-Smith, often referred to as Sandy. He is one of the world's most prolific and best-loved authors. For many years, he was a professor of medical law and worked in universities in the UK and abroad. Before turning his hand to writing fiction, he has written and contributed to more than 100 uh, books, including specialist academic titles, short story collections, and a number of immensely popular children's books, including the highly successful The Number One Ladies Detective Agency series that Alexander became a household name. The series has now sold over 20 million copies in the English language alone, and since the books took off, he has devoted his time to writing and you, the listeners, all know the books as we on Team Buzz Radio give you the chance to win them. Welcome to Team Buzz Radio, uh, Sandy. Thank you very much indeed. You have a, an extraordinary life story growing up in Bulawayo. Did I pronounce it correctly? No, not not too bad. <laughs> okay. I in think, the Ella, colony. I think yeah. it's uh, Bulawayo, yes? Yes, that's probably the, uh, the okay. way Okay. In the British colony of Southern Rhodesia, it's a Zimbabwe today. What was it like growing up there? Did you go to school? Did you explore? Did. did you have tutors? How did it go? I did. I did go to school. I spent my childhood in the middle of Africa, in what is now Zimbabwe, and the rest of my life in Scotland. So uh, that was a long time ago that I was there. But I have continued to take an interest in Africa and uh, regularly visit Botswana. Uh, which is uh, next door and um, uh, very much like that particular country. Fantastic. And were, were you free to roam? What was it like growing up there? I mean, how many hours a day were you in school? What did you do the rest of the day? Well, I think uh, in, in those days, uh, it was uh, life was, uh, I think, probably a little bit freer for children uh, because uh, we were allowed to roam about the place more than children today uh, are allowed to do. Uh, there was, of course, less traffic and there were less reasons why why people would be concerned about children wandering around. So, yes, uh, I have memories of childhood, which was uh, a childhood of, of uh, considerable um, physical freedom. Um, and uh, I think that's, uh, that, that was a, a great start in this life. Did you yes. see wild animals? Yes, I would have. Yes, uh, uh, not. Uh, it wasn't a case of being um, surrounded by uh, lions and elephants, but uh, uh, certainly um, I remember in the garden. Certainly there were snakes and sometimes rather dangerous snakes. So you had to be careful uh, where you put your feet. Uh, I remember uh, once sitting in the garden at home and suddenly realizing that there was a large cobra uh, going past me. That sort of thing can be a little bit, uh, a little bit worrying. I absolutely love your books, and I read many from the Number One Detective Agency series. Thank you. And I have, I have to say that um, I love Precious Ramstone. I love her. She's she's very cool. I have to say she's a very cool lady, and I love her secretary Grace Makuti and her good friend, the excellent mechanic, uh, Mister J L B Mc. Matakone, yes, yes, yeah, it's a very sweet love story. That it's a friendship, sort of. Yeah, uh, was she inspired by someone you personally knew? Um, not really, not by one particular person. Uh, although I did see many years ago when I was in Botswana, I did see one lady who made me think uh, that one day I might possibly write about a lady in Botswana. Uh, and that was a woman I saw in a small village north of the capital, Khabarone, in Botswana. And uh, I saw this woman wearing a red dress, chasing after a chicken in a yard. And I thought, I wonder what her story is. And that is what happens to authors as they look about them. They see people and things and they wonder what the background story is. And from that sighting, so to speak, uh, I suppose came the idea eventually that I would sit down and write about a woman in Botswana who uses her inheritance, the cattle that had been left to her by her late father, and starts a little business. So in a sense, one person was the inspiration of the notion that I might one day write about Botswana, but wasn't uh, really the, 
the, the, the source of the character. Yeah, we do get inspired. And as a a, a English white man, how did you manage to write from a perspective of an African woman? Well, I think that I think that uh, authors uh, always uh, write about uh, other people. Well, some write, uh, writers uh, continue to write just about themselves, but that gets a little bit boring, a bit dull, and a bit limited. And so we're always writing about other people. We write about people we meet. We write about people we see in all sorts of circumstances. So. Uh, of course, it's it's possible for an author to write about anybody. Uh, the author has to ask himself or herself, what is it like to be that other person? Uh, and um, then might uh, write about those characters. And of course, authors are always doing that. Most authors write about a wide range of people rather than just about themselves. So it involves uh, an imaginative uh, process whereby uh, you imagine what the life of that person I is uh, is like. So I think my answer to your question is that um, anybody should be able to write about anybody else. Uh, they have to. They should be careful that they don't get it wrong, or that they don't uh, the, the, that they fail to 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 understand the other other character. But uh, generally speaking, this is what authors have always been doing. Did you send this uh, the story to any of your Zimbabwean friends to see if it if it if it passes well by them? Well, it isn't anything to do with Zimbabwe. Uh, it's set okay. in Botswana. Uh, yeah, and, sorry, yeah, Botswana. Yes. Yeah, uh, and uh, I uh, uh, I think that as an author, you write the story, and then you you see uh, you obviously listen to the reaction, not only of friends. In fact, it's probably better not to show material to friends because friends might not want to be utterly truthful in responding to to your story so you 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 um you gather uh, from uh, the readers really uh, what uh, what they feel uh, about it and uh, if the readers say well you've got certain things wrong then i think you should look at them very carefully uh, but if the readers say by and large uh, that uh, seems to be uh, fair enough then uh, you know that you're on the right lines. Okay, so you grew up until what age in uh, Zimbabwe? I, I spent my entire childhood in Zimbabwe until I was 18. And then uh, the rest of my life I've spent in Scotland with the exception of one or two periods when I've lived abroad. I lived in Ireland uh, for a year and then I've spent uh, periods, uh, brief periods in the United States. And so mostly in, in Scotland. Uh, so Scotland is uh, is is where I live. This is my home, and I, as I say, I've spent most of my life uh, here. Did you find it strange when you moved from Zimbabwe to Scotland? Like it's no. very different, isn't it? It's quite different. Not not yes, I think that that's that's right. Obviously, certain things are are, are different, but uh, uh, I was uh, I think at an adaptable age. I think that one can adapt to different circumstances um, quite easily uh, when you're in your late teens and uh, then you 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 uh, uh, find it easier. I think later in life uh, it may be more difficult because one is more set in one's ways and uh, one's opinions and attitudes are formed but um, I think uh, prior to that it's possible to uh, adapt quite easily. Like, would you would you see people doing something and thinking, oh, this would have been done very differently from where I grew up, or see the the, the cultural differences and feel feel the the change? Because I'm I'm uh, I grew up in two different countries as well, so I always see the difference. I mean, I love both, mm -hmm. but it's I can always really see the difference. Like, see, oh, we'd be doing this differently over here or over there. Yes, I, I, th I think a lot of people uh, spend parts of their lives in different uh, countries and different societies, and they will always have an awareness of things being uh, being different. Uh, I spend, uh, I travel widely, um, I, I go all over the world at the moment, and uh, I am conscious of different habits, customs, attitudes. So yes, I think that if one is, is it keeps one's eyes open, uh, you will see things being done differently in different uh, places. I think the important thing is uh, to remind oneself 
that there's not just one way of doing things and that there are all sorts of uh, different approaches to life, uh, each of which has its particular validity. Yes. So you're a lawyer specialising in medical law and bioethics. Um, did you practice law once you finished your studies? No, I, I was an uh, academic lawyer. I was a professor of law. Uh, and so I spent my working life in uh, faculty of law of, of university. In fact, that was what I was doing when I went to Botswana. It was to start a law school there for the university uh, some years ago. And uh, the, so that, that was my particular, uh, my particular um, area. Uh, I was a professor of medical law, uh, which involves looking at the relationship between law and, and medicine. Uh, I was concerned with those particular uh, issues. And I suppose that uh, that's a fairly interesting field. And I suppose it had an influence of some sort on my subsequent writing. When did you realize you were a writer? When did you when, when did you make the change from academic to mm. writer? Well, I think that that's a, a very interesting question. I think that most writers uh, know from a very early age uh, that they uh, are writers or would like to be writers. Uh, I think that if you look at uh, the uh, the way in which uh, many children like telling stories, writing little books, uh, that's an indication of that sort of ambition or the seeds of that sort of uh, ambition. So I knew from uh, an early age that I wanted to write. And uh, indeed, I sent my first manuscript off to a publisher at the age of eight, uh, which was a little bit early. Did. Um, yes, but it was only about one page. <laughs> and so the publisher was very kind uh, and wrote back and said that, uh, unfortunately, this didn't suit that publishing company's purposes. Uh, but uh, I was very pleased to have had a reply to my very yeah. brief manuscript. So I continued. Um, and uh, all my life, therefore, uh, I think I have wanted to um, to write. And then I started to do it uh, in a more serious fashion uh, in my late 20s. And then uh, I wrote uh, over 40 children's books. Uh, and then I started to write novels. I wrote 60 or 70 novels. Um, so, uh, And I'm still doing that. Um, so um, uh, writing is like any other uh, form of um, artistic expression. It's something that, that the person who uh, does it often feels they have to do it. Uh, yeah. It's rather like being a singer or a dancer yeah. or a painter. That is what you have to do. It's there inside you. You keep writing. You publish more than a book every year, don't you? Yes. How I write... do you do that? I That's write... an incredible pace. Yes, well, I, I write five or six books a year, and uh, I do that by I, having a, a very, uh, I suppose, organized work regime. Uh, writing is, is something that uh, some people feel you have to wait for the muse to come and tap you on the shoulder for inspiration to arrive. It doesn't work that way. Uh, you actually have to sit down at your desk and do it in the same way in which you would do any other job. So I write every day. I'm very fortunate in being able to write uh, quite quickly. I write a thousand words an hour when I'm writing. Wow. So that enables me to uh, produce uh, a fair number of books uh, each year. The year is divided into different seasons for different books. Um, so I usually would take uh, two or three months to write a book. Um, sometimes I'm writing two at the same time, and then I would move on to the next, the next one. So that's uh, that's the way I approach it. Now, this isn't really um, the usual story with writers who who might write a book once a year or every other year. But I seem to be breaking the rules in that <laughs> respect. But I rather enjoy doing it. I have a a, a, a question because I do that as a I, I'm a singer and I'm a songwriter, and mm. um, I get ideas and I record them quickly on my <laughs> phone or I write little notes. Do you do that? Yes, I do, and I, I imagine I'm very interested to hear that you you would do that in your in your the writing of your your songs, and that presumably you hear a little melody or whatever, and then you'll you'll put it down and 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 no doubt transcribe it. 
uh, onto the page in, in, in due course. And that's the same really with, uh, with authors. Uh, many authors carry a book with them and they will write down little snippets of conversation that they hear ideas. ideas. So I do have those notebooks, uh, rather like your notebooks, I should imagine, where I, I put in suggestions to myself as to um, something that somebody will say in one of the books or a storyline. Uh, and then that will be worked worked upon and will be developed into a more complete work later on. An adaptation for the screen of the number one ladies detective agency was made in 2007. I watched it and I absolutely loved it. And um, it was uh, with Jill Scott, the amazing Jill Scott playing Precious. Yes. What did you think uh, of the adaptation? Well, I thought that it was uh, very beautifully done. Uh, the director of that, uh, uh, the person who got it off the, uh, got it off to a start in a sense, and certainly with the first feature film which uh, led to the series, was Antony Mengele, who was a very great uh, film director, alas, no longer with us, but he made the most beautiful, beautiful films. He had great difficulty in casting uh, the film, and uh, he was rapidly approaching the time when they would have to start filming it, and he didn't have all his actors uh, lined up, uh, so it was it was quite a difficult job for him. But he found um, really wonderful actors for the principal roles. Uh, the one that you mentioned, Jill Scott, who plays Mara Matsue in the in the series, uh, was just magnificent. She, as you said, is um, is a jazz singer, principally a jazz singer, very yeah. well known and appreciated as a jazz singer. But she also acted really very very well indeed. And then her sidekick, Mama Kutsi, uh, was played beautifully by Annika Nonni Rose, who was uh, another a very fine actress. And uh, Mr. J.L.B. Matacone was played by Lucian Imsamati, who did it very well. So I was very pleased indeed with the choice of actors for the main characters. OK, so I found out that you are an amateur bassoonist. And you co-founded the Really Terrible Orchestra. And you've also helped to found Botswana's first center for opera training. Um, so can you tell me a bit more about your musical career? Well, I, I'm, I'm a very bad musician. I'm aware of the fact that you're a professional musician and therefore I feel very inadequate talking about <laughs> my own music uh, playing because I'm a very, very amateurish musician and a bad amateur musician. I like playing wind instruments. I uh, The first wind instrument that I learned was the saxophone. I enjoy playing the saxophone. I did play a bassoon in an amateur orchestra, but I've since then moved to uh, playing the um, baritone sax in that orchestra. And my wife and I, 20 years ago, founded something uh, called the Rarely Terrible Orchestra, which is an amateur orchestra for people who aren't very good at playing their instruments. And we had many people who came and asked for a seat in that orchestra. And we have wonderful fun. It's very difficult for us to reach the end of the piece at the same time. There are always stragglers. There are always notes in the wrong place. But our audiences, and we do play in public, our audiences are delighted to see a group of absolute amateurs making complete fools of themselves <laughs> on the stage so uh it's it's a great uh, it's a great uh, orchestra i i am interested in in opera um and, and singing in general i did start um many years ago i set up a little little opera house tiny opera house with 50 seats in botswana it ran for five years it's no longer there but we did we did have uh, some lovely uh productions uh including the first opera translated from english into the local language Setswana, and also the premiere of an opera, a short chamber opera that I'd written with a composer friend called the Okavanga Macbeth. And uh, we ran that at that little, little theatre. So uh, that was most enjoyable. Did you write the music or the li only the lyrics to that opera? I, I just do lyrics. Uh, I, I wish that I could, <coughs> I could compose. I envy you, your ability to compose. But I, I can't do that. So I write, <clears throat> I write the, the 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 words. In the case of opera, the libretti. Uh, in the case of song cycles, the lyrics for a song cycle. And I work fairly extensively with composers 
uh, on that. I very much enjoy working with uh, composers, which in collaborations, in which I I provide the, the 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 words and they provide the music. Many times, artists and writers have other artists and writers in their family. Um, do you have, oh no, your parents, maybe other members of your family that are also artistic? Well, I think uh, members of my family are interested in the arts, um, and uh, my one of my daughters uh, uh, write, writes a bit. Uh, has certainly writ written a bit in the in the past. Uh, but um, no, I'm I'm the only uh, I'm the only writer in the family at at, at the moment. Um, I agree with you, though, that sometimes these things occur in 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 families. But uh, in in my case, I, I have three sisters. None of them writes. Uh, they all enjoy reading, though. Uh, I think yeah. we're all very keen readers. What would you say to your 15-year-old self today? I'm asking because most of our listeners are teenagers. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that it, it would be wonderful if you could um, if you could tell us what would you say to your 15-year-old self now, all these years later, that you didn't know then, maybe? Or well, I, I probably, yeah, I probably, the first thing I would say to my 15-year-old self would be, don't take yourself too seriously. I think that that's, uh, that's quite important. And that, um, as an adjunct of that advice, would be the advice not to worry. Don't worry too much about things, because sometimes in one's mid-teens, one is worried about things that you really don't have to worry about. You're worried about what other people think about you. Don't worry about that. I think that's really very um, important. And then the other thing I would say is <clears throat> pay attention to friendships because friendships are such an important thing in one's life. And when you're in your teens, when you're younger, it's easy to make friends. Make a lot of friends, treat your friends well, cultivate those friendships, keep in touch with them. Often we forget to keep in touch with people and later we regret it. So we don't always understand when we're young just how important friendship is and what we have to do in order to service and preserve our friendships. And final bit of advice I would give to my 15 year, year old self and indeed to anybody of 15 who came up and asked for advice, and that would be be kind. That's all you need to do in this life is to be, be kind to other people. Simple advice but it's, I think, the most profound advice anybody could give you. I want to ask, where do you see yourself in five or ten years? Do you have any more goals? I mean, you've achieved so much so far. Is there anything else that you that you have your eyes set, your heart set on? Not really. Um, I would uh, just uh, want to carry on doing what I'm doing at the moment. Um, as long as I'm spared, uh, I will continue to uh, to to write. Uh, so uh, let's hope that nothing comes along which stops me doing that. Alexander McCall-Smith, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us at Team Buzz Radio. Thank, thank you, you so very much, much for this inspiring, <laughs> inspiring meeting. Thank, thank you. you. All the Bye. best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.